It's the end of January, and that means that winter baseball is near the end. Almost all championship series have concluded, and the Caribbean series will begin on February 1st. In this video, I'll give a recap of each winter league season, tell you who the stars were, show you the final standings, and let you know how the playoffs went down. Then, I'll do a preview of the Caribbean series and end it with my predictions. Teams from six professional leagues in six different countries have qualified for the series, and I will cover them all. But first, I'd like to start with the outcast of winter baseball, the Australian Baseball League. For obvious geographical reasons, the ABL champion does not take part in the Caribbean series. So, Australian baseball ends with the ABLCS, which runs from February 7th to the 9th. The ABL regular season ended last Sunday. Southwest Division was topped by the Adelaide Giants, who grabbed the number one seed for the playoffs. Melbourne and Perth were close behind and tied for second, a close race between those three teams. Geelong Korea was once again the worst team in the league, 15 games under 500. The big surprise came in the Northeast Division, where the Auckland Tuatara went from last to first, capturing a division title on the final day of the season in only its second year in the league, and earning the number two seed in the playoffs. Canberra was right behind them. Defending champion Brisbane was close, but just missed the playoffs. For the Blue Sox, a disappointing season, finishing at the bottom. The Adelaide Giants were the top batting team with a .252 team average, and in stolen bases with 47. The Melbourne Aces led the league in both slugging and on-base percentage, both at 365. Perth had the most home runs with 51. Northeast Division champs, the Auckland Tuatara, were in the bottom half of the league in most offensive categories. Best team ERA belonged to Perth at 321, followed by Adelaide and Melbourne. Geelong Korea's losing ways can be explained by their pitching, a 752 team ERA. Adelaide also had the ERA leader, Gunnar Kynes, who had a 150 ERA and 9 starts. 27-year-old South African-born Dylan Unsworth of Perth led the league with 6 wins and 75 Ks through 10 starts. Delman Young of Melbourne, the MVP of the Venezuelan League last year and prior to that a 10-year Major League veteran, led the league with 13 home runs and 42 RBI. His OPS was 982. His teammate Colin Willis led the league with a 427 batting average and 520 on base percentage. Stolen base leader was Adelaide's Aaron Whitefield with 23. The LBPRC in Puerto Rico played a 32-game schedule this year. Carolina led the standings early, but defending champion Cangrejeros de Santurce took over the lead and won the regular season comfortably, ending with a five-game lead over second-place Gigantes. Indios de Mayagüez finished just one game behind Carolina and settled for third. Atenienses de Manati returned to the league after a 12-year absence and for the first time in club history qualified for the playoffs. Criollos de Caguas, though historically a great team, finished nine games under 500 and did not make the playoffs. Manatee's postseason debut didn't go well. They were easily disposed of by Cangrejeros in four games. Indios and Gigantes were very close to each other in the regular season and, as one would expect, played a close series in the semifinals. In the end, Indios prevailed in six. In the final series, Cangrejeros continued their dominance, winning it in five games, their second league title in a row, and fourth in the last six years. Cangrejeros will be looking to improve on last year's Caribbean Series performance, where they lost all four games in Group B play. Surprisingly, if you look at team batting, it's almost an inversion of the standings, with Criollos at the top and Santurce at the bottom. Looking at on-base percentage, it starts to make more sense. Santurce was second and Caguas fourth. Manati was the top slugging team with a league-leading 18 home runs. Santurce was pretty weak in this category, too, second from the bottom. Team ERA more closely resembles the final standings. All you'd need to do is switch Carolina and Santurce at the top. Gigantes de Carolina easily had the best pitching, and also had better hitting than Cangrejeros, but somehow finished five games behind them in the final standings. Not sure how that happened. Santurce had the league's top two batting leaders. Vimael Machin won the batting title with a 333 average. Ivan De Jesus Jr. was right behind him at 329. De Jesus had a 463 on base percentage and 957 OPS, leading the league in both of those categories. So though Cangrejeros didn't do well as a team offensively, they did have the best individual hitters. Jose Sermo of Manati and Kenis Vargas of Mayagüez tied for the lead in home runs with five apiece. Carolina's Hector Santiago led all pitchers with a 0.73 ERA and 0.80 whip in 49 innings, which also led the league. There were four pitchers with ERA under two. Definitely a pitcher's league. Lidom in the Dominican Republic was dominated by Toros del Este, 19 games over 500, playing a 50-game schedule, seven games ahead of the nearest team. Tigres del Aise was that nearest team, the only other team over 500. Aguilas and Leones tied for third and qualified for the postseason. 
Missing the postseason were Gigantes and defending champion Estrellas Orientales. Toros carried their dominance into the postseason, going 12-6 in the round-robin pool. The other three teams tied at 8-10. To break the tie, Aguilas beat Leones, then Tigres beat Aguilas to join Toros in the best-of-nine final series. Tigres put up a good fight in the final series, but Toros, as expected, claimed its third championship in team history with a 5-3 series win. The team ERA rankings were an exact reflection of the standings. Toros led the way at 294, Estrellas at the bottom at 385. If you want to win in this league, stock up on pitching. Hitting is good to have, too, though. As a team, Toros led the league in on-base percentage and slugging, resulting in the most runs scored of any team. Team batting was led by Leones. Aguilas hit the most home runs. Tigres stole the most bases. Three of the top five pitchers in ERA came from Toros del Este. The other two were Tigres pitchers. No coincidence that those two teams made it to the final series. Cesar Valdez was at the top with a 111 ERA. Gigantes had the league's best hitter. Moises Sierra led the league in batting average, on-base percentage, and OPS. Peter O'Brien of Toros hit a league-leading nine home runs. Tigris outfielder Nick Heath stole 16 bases, twice the number of the next best base stealer. It was an unusual season in Venezuela, 42 games instead of 60. No players returning from MLB. The two teams at the bottom last year became the top two teams this year. Tiburones de la Huayra was first. Aguilas went from last a year ago to half a game out of first, tied with defending champions Cardinales. Caribes and Navigantes were not far behind. Leones, runner-up in the finals last year, just made the playoffs. Tigres and Bravos missed it. In the first round of the playoffs, all series went to six games, the favored team winning every time. Tiburones over Leones, Cardinales over Navagantes, and Aguilas over Caribes. In the Venezuelan playoff system, two of the losing teams play a one-game playoff to be the fourth team to reach the semifinals. Leones had the worst regular season record of all playoff teams, so they went home. Caribes beat Navegantes, and they advanced to the next round. In the semifinal round, you don't get any second chances. Caribes knew that, so they were sure to take care of business the first time, sweeping top-seeded Tiburones in four games. Cardinales advanced to the finals by beating Aguilas in five games. In the final, Cardinales de Lara won an exciting series that went a full seven games to capture their second championship in a row. In last year's Caribbean series, Cardinales tied with the other two teams in Group A, but when counting runs scored and runs against, they were placed third and unable to advance to the final. In the same way that ERA rankings reflected the standings in Lidom, team batting rankings were almost a mirror image of the standings in Venezuela. Tiburones led the way with a 302 average. Caribes, middle of the pack in the regular season, but strong in the playoffs, led the league in team on-base percentage, slugging, and home runs. Cardinales de Lara had the best pitching with a 378 team ERA. Bravos de Margarita was last with a 591 ERA to go along with their last place team batting. It was not a good year for Bravos. There were 13 players in LVBP with an on-base percentage over 400. League leader Yosmani Guerra of Aguilas was at 483. He also batted 388. His teammate Jay Austin beat him for the batting title with a 392 average. Another pair of teammates, Dennis Phipps and Rene Reyes of Caribes, tied for the league lead in home runs with nine. Phipps also led the league with a 581 slugging. And two Cardinales teammates were first and second in ERA. Henry Centeno had a 134 ERA. Angelo Palumbo's ERA was 187, once again showing that pitching wins championships. In the Mexican Pacific League, Yaquiz de Obregón won both halves of the regular season, earning 20 overall points, the highest possible. There was a three-way tie for second. Naranjeros de Hermosillo, Charros de Jalisco, and Tomateros de Culiacán all ended with 15 points. All three of them finished in the top five in both the first and second stages. Aguilas de Mexicali got off to a really bad start, but finished strong to earn a fifth-place finish. Cañeros de los Mochis, Venados de Mazatlán, and Sultanes de Monterrey round out the playoff qualifying teams. Monterrey, a summer league ball club, was making its debut in the winter league this year. Algodoneros de Wasave, returning to the league after a five-year absence, tied for last and missed the playoffs. Joining them was Mayos de Navajoa at the bottom. In the first round of the playoffs, top-seeded Obregón beat Monterrey in five games. No surprise there. But a big surprise was Venados de Mazatlán knocking off Hermosillo in six. Los Mochis won a hard-fought series over defending champions Charros in seven. Tomateros beat Aguilas more easily than expected in five games. The semifinal round brought more surprises from Venados. This time they took care of Yaquis de Obregón, a team that had looked so dominant during the regular season. 
That one went a full seven games. Also going seven games, Tomateros de Culiacan held off Los Mochis to reach the final. And it would be another seven games in the final, with Tomateros coming out on top four games to three. This one ended Thursday night, meaning that Tomateros will have the shortest rest time of any team heading into the Caribbean series. Just as with the other leagues, the teams with the best pitching were more often than not the teams that won the most games. But surprisingly, Mexicali had the best team ERA at 283. Obregón was second, followed by some other winning teams. Jalisco ranked 8th out of 10 in Team ERA, although they were one of the best teams. They were carried by their offense. Charros de Jalisco topped the league in team batting, on-base percentage, slugging, run scored, and home runs. That made up for their bad pitching. Mexicali, the top pitching team, was in the bottom half of the league in all offensive statistics, which explains why their pitching couldn't carry them all the way to the top. One impressive team stat was Tomateros de Culiacan's 101 steals in 66 games. Second was Obregón with just 50. Aguilas de Mexicali had two pitchers in the top three for ERA, including league leader Javier Solano, though it's worth pointing out that both Aguilas pitchers had losing records. That team really needs some offensive weapons to go with that pitching. Batting title went to Isaac Rodriguez Salazar of Los Mochis with a 340 average. On-base leader was Yadiel Hernandez of Hermosillo with a 462 on-base percentage. Home run king was Dariel Alvarez of Culiacan with 16. He also had the best slugging at 562. And those 100-plus stolen bases by Culiacan? Rico Noel stole 30 to lead the league. Teammate Sebastian Alizalde was second with 21. The rest of the team had 50. So speed is obviously a top priority with this ball club. Over to Panama's league, known as Pro Base, and home to defending Caribbean Series champions Toros de Herrera. Toros did not follow up well to that Cinderella season. They tied with Aguilas Metropolitanas at the bottom. The two teams from Chiriqui were at the top. Federales de Chiriqui had the best record at 14-7. and seven. Astronautas de Chiriqui was next at 12-9. and nine. But in the championship series, Astronautas came away victorious, winning the series three games to one. They move on to the Caribbean series. In Cuba, the Cocodrilos of Matanzas won their first ever championship since the team's establishment in 1992. This follows a recent trend in the Cuban National Series where teams are capturing their first titles while traditional powerhouses have taken a step back. Matanzas was third in the regular season standings behind Camagüe and defending champions Las Tunas. Industriales, Cuba's most famous team, finished fourth. In the semifinal round, Matanzas advanced by beating Las Tunas three games to one, while Camagüe moved on by sweeping Industriales. In the final round, Matanzas won four games to two. Camagüe, founded in 1977, was also seeking its first title. That'll have to wait another year. But unfortunately for Matanzas, a national title does not mean a trip to the Caribbean Series. Due to visa issues, no Cuban team will be participating this year. As a replacement, the champions from Colombia's league, the LCBP, will take part in this year's Caribbean Series. Colombia plays a 40-game schedule, and Toros de Cincelejo managed 30 wins. Caimanes de Barranquilla, the league's most successful ball club, finished four games back. Gigantes de Barranquilla and Vaqueros de Monteria finished over 500 and made the playoffs. As you can see, a huge gap between those who made the playoffs and those who didn't. A pair of upsets in the semifinals as Vaqueros beat Toros three games to two, while Gigantes beat Caimanes in four games. In the final, Vaqueros beat Gigantes four games to one to claim their first title since the 1999-2000 season and their first ever since moving to Monteria. So, your six Caribbean Series participants will be Cangrejeros de San Terce of Puerto Rico, Toros del Este of Dominican Republic, Cardenales de Lara of Venezuela, Tomateros de Culiacan of Mexico, Astronautes de Chiriqui of Panama, and Vaqueros de Monteria of Colombia. The series begins tomorrow, February 1st. This will be the 50th Caribbean Series since it got restarted in 1970, and the 62nd overall. Every team plays every day from Saturday the 1st until Wednesday the 5th. The top four will play in the semifinals on Thursday, and the winners meet on Friday in a one-game winner-take-all starting at 8 p.m. local time or 7 p.m. eastern time. This year's edition takes place in San Juan, Puerto Rico for the first time since 2015. All games will be played at Hiram Bithorn Stadium, the largest ballpark by capacity on the island, and the host venue for a number of WBC and MLB games including a three-game series between the Miami Marlins and New York Mets this April. And now I'll try to predict the outcome of the 2020 Caribbean Series. Hard to do when you have six leagues all from different countries that haven't played each other all year, but I'll give it my best shot. Here we go. Vaqueros de Monteria will finish at the bottom. They finished just a hair over 500 in Colombia. I don't expect them to compete with the top teams of winter baseball. 
It will be fun to watch a new country play in the Caribbean series, but I think Vaqueros will be the victims of some lopsided scores. Astronautas de Chiriqui will not fare well either. Against all odds, the team from Panama won last year's Caribbean series, but they were playing in their home country and came with the element of surprise. That won't happen again. After greatly exceeding expectations a year ago, I expect the Panamanian team to meet expectations and finish fifth. I don't expect much from Cardenales de Lara. The Venezuelan league was a little chaotic this year, with the reduced schedule and the absence of major league players resulting in some crazy individual stats. Just based on talent levels, this year's LVBP champion comes up short when compared to the top three teams. However, this could be a motivating factor for Cardenales. They might come out playing harder, like they've got something to prove, and it would not surprise me if the Venezuelan team, playing with the right attitude, managed to capture the crown. But I won't count on it. Cardenales fourth. That leaves Cangrejeros de Santurce and Toros del Este in the final. You might be tempted to pick Cangrejeros here based solely on the fact that they're playing at home. But if you look at past Caribbean series results, you'll see that the home team usually doesn't win, and most of the time doesn't even reach the final. So just like last year's World Series, we'll assume that home field advantage is no advantage at all. Both of these teams were regular season champs and showed no weakness in the postseason. They both rose to the top because of their pitching. But, Toro's pitching was more dominant, and they were better offensively, led by 26-year-old Detroit Tigers infielder Heimer Candelario, who has a 1.031 OPS in the postseason. Cangrejero's pitching will keep the score low, but the Toro's offense will eke out a few runs, and that'll be enough. My guess for the final score is 3-1 Toro's. It will be their first ever Caribbean Series title, and the first for a Lidome team since 2012. For the ABL Championship Series, I'm picking the Adelaide Giants over the Melbourne Aces, two games to one. That's what I think. Let me know in the comments what you think. Enjoy the series, and until next time, this is Baseball International. See ya.